Uh, I would argue that pragmatism is not always practical in the long run. If playing everything by ear on a day-to-day -day basis uh, makes people conclude that you don't really stand for anything, or at least not for anything that anyone can figure out and depend on, <laughs> moderation is all right if it's not carried to extremes. <laughs> I remember some years ago uh, when there was riots ri ri threatened in Chicago, and Mayor Daley, the original Mayor Daley, uh, came, on the, came on the television and announced that he had given his police orders to shoot to kill. Uh, he was excoriated through the press throughout the country. And just last year, after the Los Angeles riots, I had my research assistant check out how many people had died as a result of that order. Nobody had died as a result of that order. But because we had a kinder and gentler policy last year, five dozen people lost their lives. Now, intellectuals judge by words, and so they judge Mayor Daley harshly. Uh, I judge by deeds, and I judge the people harshly last year who were more concerned to be politically correct than they were with saving lives. Well, we're back with another Thomas Sowell video. Listening to that clip, you would think he was talking about last year with the George Floyd riots terrorizing our cities, people being murdered in CHOP, mayhem and chaos everywhere through these soft-headed policing policies. Uh, I can guarantee you defunding the police will only create more death and more tragedy. This was back in 1993, and he also talks about how if we had only stopped our spending from growing, if we just stayed spending at the same rates with government spending, we wouldn't be in this mess we're in today with all the money printing and inflation. The Fed is just boxed in. It can't do anything else but print money at this point. I've explained it in so many other videos. But here, once again, Thomas Sowell, many years ago, had identified the problem and spoke of the solution, and it was soundly ignored. But most of this video is about the politics in Washington and how unsuccessful the Republicans have been on the right creating an alternative narrative to the left. The left is allowed to go as far extreme left as possible. Anything is open, anything is acceptable, as radical as you want to go. And the left is just, I mean, and the right's just, oh, well, let's just have a little less of that, as opposed to offering a real sound counter alternative. There's a great Q&A at the end, where he has with a congressman at the time, and you can see the difference in intelligence level of some of these men is very broad. Um, it's pretty shocking sometimes, actually. Enjoy the rest of the presentation, and we'll be back soon. I'm Bill McCollum, and as most of you know, but not all of you, I'm vice chairman of the House Republican Conference, and I've given, been given the charge. You can't hear anything this morning, still too much noise. I don't have a whistle. Not the Bob Michael whistle anyway this morning. We're all wide awake after watching that great movie last night or whatever. Listen, seriously, this morning we have a very full schedule. We have some wonderful guests with us for our opening session this morning. And we need very much to get on with the program this morning. As you know, we have breakout sessions that follow this at 10.30. So we're, we have two stages of this. We have, have actually four speakers. Our keynote speaker for this morning in covering virtually all of the issues that are domestic other than the economy as such, and we have a whole session on just uh, the economy. Uh, our first speaker this morning to give us this overview is Dr. Thomas Sowell, and we're really delighted to have him with us. Dr. Sowell has not appeared before our group before, before the House Republicans, and so it's a, a great honor for us to have him with us this morning. He is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, and he's written extensively on economics, social decision making, and ethnicity. Dr. Sowell had his undergraduate degree uh, from Harvard University, his master's degree from Columbia, and he has received his PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. In addition to being uh, out where he is now at the Hoover Institution, Dr. Sowell has been a professor of economics at the University of California at Los Angeles from 1974 to 1980, and he has taught at several other universities, including Rutgers, Howard, Cornell, Brandeis, and Amherst. At one point in time, he was with the United States Department of Labor, serving as an economist there, and also was an economic analyst for AT&T. He's written extensively in a lot of books that are out there right now. I can't begin to list all of them for you. 
One of his more famous and current books is A Conflict of Visions. Another one many of you have heard of is Civil Rights, Rhetoric or Reality. And one that I think is very appropriate for some of the discussion on education this morning is entitled Education Assumptions Versus History. At any rate, I'm not going to encroach any further on his time. We're just delighted and honored to have as our keynote speaker this morning, Dr. Thomas Sowell. Tom, come on up and be with us. We're very happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much. About uh, 45 minutes ago, someone uh, showed me the title of the talk this morning, <laughs> which did not coincide with what I uh, had prepared, which is political pragmatism versus principle. Uh, the situation facing the country today, uh, at the beginning of the second Carter administration, uh, is, is a challenge both to those of us who write about politics and those who practice it. In both cases, the challenge is the same. Whether to be practical uh, and argue for the best that can reasonably be expected under the circumstances, uh, or uh, to uh, take a more uh, fundamental position on enduring principles. A similar choice was offered uh, on a smaller scale recently with the nomination of Zoe Beard to be Attorney General. Uh, some conservatives uh, chose to go along with the nomination on the grounds that this was probably the best we were going to get out of the current administration. While others decided to make this a, a matter of principle, to fight over whether the chief law enforcement officer of the country should be someone who is admitted to multiple violations of federal laws. At, at least this is how pragmatism is often defined. Uh, I would argue that pragmatism is not always practical in the long run. If playing everything by ear on a day-to-day -day basis uh, makes people conclude that you don't really stand for anything, or at least not for anything that anyone can figure out and depend on. <laughs> Moderation is all right if it's not carried to extremes. <laughs> <laughs> the history of conservative pragmatism over the past few decades has not been a happy one. That history might be summarized in broad terms by saying that during liberal administrations, the country has moved sharply to the left, and during conservative administrations, it's moved more slowly to the left. <laughs> but the fundamental direction has not changed. It was, after all, conservative but pragmatic Republican administrations which put some of the most radically activist justices on the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, Blackman, uh, Brennan, Warren. It was, it was conservative, pragmatic Republican administrations which introduced group quotas and race norming of tests and which first imposed wage and price controls in peacetime. For a long time, conservatives who were intent on balancing the budget uh, have been uh, urging higher taxes to pay for the liberal social programs. So that while the liberals are allowed to play Santa Claus, the pragmatic conservatives uh, have played Frank Nitti the Enforcer. <laughs> there have been no scientific polls on the subject, but congressional election results over the past few decades suggest that Santa Claus has much broader political support than Frank Nitti. Pragmatic conservatism has not been confined to those in political office, in the media as well. The argument has been made under impeccable conservative auspices that we are undertaxed, that the public should pay for whatever level of government activity they choose to have. The problem with that logic uh, is that it fails to recognize the relationship between price and quantity demanded, and that's the most basic relationship in economics. It's precisely because the government is offering things free or at below cost that the demand for those things is so high, or rather the quantity demanded. To levy a general tax to pay for things that people would not pay for individually if they were presented with the actual price tags makes no sense. Since needs are, in, are infinite, that kind of policy means an unlimited expansion of the welfare state. We might well go to hell in a handbasket, but some of the pragmatists would say, that at least we did it in a fiscally responsible way. 
One of the many uh, achievements of Ronald Reagan was to demonstrate that tax rates can go down as well as up. He also recognized that Supreme Court nominees must be chosen on some basis other than the pragmatic basis that they are easy to get confirmed. More than anything else, he recognized that it takes a vision to beat a vision, that visions are not just frosting on the political cake. Today, the Clinton administration is demonstrating that even a half-baked vision can capture people's imagination if there is no competing vision out there. People do not rally to the barricades under banners reading, Me Too, maybe not so much, or go along to get along. One of the reasons for the political success of the left in countries around the world is not only that they have a vision, but they understand, as their opponents often do not, that those who control the past control the future. The rewriting of history to fit an ideological agenda goes on in history textbooks from the elementary schools to the colleges, and not only in the, in the United States. It goes on on the Hollywood screen, and it goes on on the small screen of television news and public affairs. Thus, the longest sustained expansion of the economy and history has now been transformed into a period of dire suffering where only the rich were, were well off. A decade in which federal revenues doubled has been transformed into a period in which deficits ballooned because of tax cuts for the rich. So long as that vision is out there, so long as people think that the deficit exists because of inadequate revenues, raising taxes will always be the first recourse. Even those liberal politicians who know better also know that this is the way to get money flowing into Washington. Even the most flimsy falsehood will stand up unless someone knocks it over. The numbers are readily available, easy to put on a graph, Moreover, the public has already shown that it will listen. When millions of people last year tuned in to watch a little guy with big ears point at charts and graphs, it shows that you can talk sense to people, that you don't need something uh, fancy to get around talking heads. The public can understand that tax rates went down while tax revenues went up. But first, someone has to say it. They have to say it clearly, loudly, and repeatedly. The public can understand that tax revenue will continue to grow, go up, regardless of whether any of these uh, draconian tax policies are passed. And that if you can just keep the spending from going up faster, you can reduce the deficit without all the melodrama. For example, if spending had been frozen at the 1980 level, you would have had a budget surplus by 1984. And if spending had been frozen at the 1984 level, you would have had a budget surplus by 1989. But so long as the discussion continues using loose words like taxes, making no distinction between tax rates and tax revenues, so long will it appear plausible that we must either raise taxes or cut spending in order to reduce the deficit. Whereas all we have to do is to reduce the rate of growth of spending to the growth that takes place in the tax base automatically. Now, no one needs to pretend that it will be easy to stop entitlement programs from ballooning. But to have any hope of doing that, the public must first know that that is, in fact, the problem, not tax cuts for the rich, not the fact that the rich are not paying their fair share. Two terms that I've never seen defined, by the way. Uh, the rich used to mean over 200,000 during the election campaign, but that's been cut in half recently. And if you, if you go by people whose taxes are going to be increased, it includes people who are making $30,000 and are retired. Now, anyone who's making $30,000 and thinks he's rich has big, big problems <laughs> over and beyond the taxes. <laughs> Someone has to say all these things. They're not too difficult for the public to understand. 
someone has to come out and say, the emperor has no clothes. Not hint around obliquely about his sartorial inappropriateness. <laughs> someone also needs to challenge the very idea of entitlement. If only because society as a whole has no entitlement to anything. Even bare subsistence has to be produced or we die. Now the only way someone can be exempted from this is to put his burden on someone else because society has no way of escaping. Without some sense of these basic realities, we're wide open to the kind of demagoguery put forth in last year's conventions of the Democrats in New York, where their presidential candidate said that health care was a right, not a privilege. Now this is a very neat dichotomy because it does an end run around 99% of the things in life which are neither rights nor privileges, but things that we have to work for, including the respect of other people. For society as a whole, everything has to be worked for. Now I know that work is, a, is the only four letter word we're not supposed to use these days, <laughs> but we're gonna have to risk saying it. Perhaps the most famous slogan of last year was, the economy stupid. <laughs> At the risk of acquiring yet another term of opprobrium to add to my present collection, I would say that the key issue is not the economy, and that we would be stupid to let ourselves be stampeded by those who claim that it is. The administration's desperate efforts to, re to, to rescue the economy before it rescues itself, reflects an urgent need to make use of a sense of panic that cannot last after the current upturn reaches the point where millions of new jobs are being created. Historians of the future may have a hard time explaining how we in 1993 allowed ourselves to be panicked by a national debt <coughs> that is a smaller percentage of the gross national product than the national debt of 10 years ago, and only a fraction of the percentage of the gross national product of the national debt of 50 years ago, neither of which led to anything dire. Debt statistics have no meaning in and of themselves. Debt matters only in relation to income and other resources. No one finds it shocking that a Fortune 500 company has more debt than a mom and pop store. And so we have to look at the debt in relation to the size of a growing economy. <laughs> Historians of the future will also be baffled by how we allowed a routine recession to be hyped by politicians and the media and to some kind of catastrophe that should cause us to repudiate the kind of economy which has existed for two centuries in this country which has produced the highest standard of living in the world and which is currently growing at a rate higher than our own historical average. If the issue is not the economy stupid, as the Clinton camp says, then what is it? The issue is power and its opposite freedom. This is not an administration, in my view, which has a muddled sense of how to help the economy. It's an administration with a very clear sense of how to gain more power over the economy and over the lives of ordinary people. Years before the present recession began, Robert Reich and Laura Tyson were arguing for the merits of massive government intervention in the economy. They have argued this way in good times and in bad, when the economy was going up and when the economy was coming down. It has nothing to do with the present recession, except that the present recession provides an opportunity. <clears throat> many, of, many of us want to see the economy booming on its own, but to the people around the president, that would be a cruel disappointment to all their plans to take over more of other people's lives. This is an administration that's barely a month old, and yet in that, mo that period of time, we've already seen a president indicating not only that politicians should pick winners and losers in the economy by deciding how much of the public's money to invest here rather than there 
instead of allowing the public to decide. You've also seen an, an administration which has indicated that the prices in the pharmaceutical industry should be subject to government regulation. That executive salaries should be controlled by federal tax policies, which punish corporations for paying more than the administration in Washington thinks they should be paying. It's an administration which thinks that health insurance and other employee benefits should not be negotiated by those concerned, but again, imposed from Washington. And it's even an administration which has indicated that insurance companies should not be allowed to select their own clientele and assess their own risk, but rather that they should respond to the opinions and agendas of the president's wife. Now, no economy could have survived unless it could withstand a few foolish policies. Uh, a few foolish policies are far less dangerous than the underlying vision behind them, which is a vision that would preempt the decisions of ordinary people, presumably for the greater good. Uh, long before uh, uh, Hillary Rodham became Hillary Rodham Clinton, she wrote that parents should not be allowed to determine unilaterally how their children should be raised. Unilaterally is her phrase. <laughs> Even when the Clinton administration set, speaks of government business partnerships or government business labor partnerships, it's really talking about something very far from the marketplace that's been known in this country for two centuries. <laughs> It's also very far from most people's idea of what the United States is about. This is not a blueprint for a free society, but for the corporate state. This does not mean that we're dealing with people who are closet fascists. It does mean that there are people very determined to have their own way and not very careful about how they do it or what the consequences are likely to be. As someone said in the movie Citizen Kane, Charlie wasn't cruel. He just did cruel things. <laughs> the Clinton administration is not bent on destruction. They are just likely to do destructive things. Just how destructive depends upon how much opposition they get and what kind of opposition. Whether it's the kind of opposition that says, well, maybe not so much, and is con concerned not to be too much out of step with the spirit of the times, or an opposition is going to be a, a principled opposition. In politics, the spirit of the times may not last very long. It may not last four years, just to pick an arbitrary number. Thank you. <laughs> we want to... Hey, iTrust Capital community. I am proud to announce that iTrust Capital has officially removed all monthly fees. This means that iTrust Capital is one of the only crypto IRA platforms that offers no monthly fees while holding your assets in secured cold storage. 24 seven tax-free trading, institutional cold storage security, and now zero monthly fees. This applies to both new and existing clients. Retire with crypto at iTrust Capital. We want uh, Dr. Sowell to do more than keynote us this morning. He's going to answer some questions. And as you know, his background is very broad, from economics to all of the social issues we'll be facing to many other things. And quite frankly, one of the most distinguished people we could possibly have appear before us. So I would like to call on you to ask, ask questions of him. I'm going to let him stand up here, but I'm going to try to help recognize people for you. So why don't I see if one of these mics is working? If this, uh, if yes. this little lapel mic is working, and I think it is. Is that working? Yeah, it is. Let's uh, see who wants to ask a question, and I will try to recognize people and, and identify them for you. Right over here, Ernest Istook. Yeah. So you said something that I, I think might bear some expansion. You talked about in 1980, and then it frozen by 84, there was Surplus, yeah. the same thing for 84 to 88. Would you expand a bit on what the growth revenue has been uh, and what you see might happen if we could just freeze things and use growth revenue? Well, uh, 
for, fortunately, I, 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 I got all of this from the uh, government statistics. I, I, I'm not sure how, how many people are dying to hear me rattle off these statistics. But, but do you want the actual numbers or? All right. All right. In 1984, the receipts uh, were 500.4 billion. The outlays were 686 billion. Now, by 1989, the receipts were 727 billion. But of course, by then, we were spending 932 billion. And so we have, we've had this increase by hundreds of billions of dollars during the 1980s. And it's just that the uh, spending has gone up by more hundreds of billions of dollars. There is absolutely no amount of money that Congress cannot outspend. <laughs> Who else has a question? I know we got other hands up there. Everybody's got to wake up this morning. We're just full of those congressional inquiries here this morning. Who's got another one? Yes, back over there. I'm uh, concerned that uh, more and more public policy is being made without adequate information. You talked about parole. His billion dollars helped him get on. But how do we, there's more and more people as government grows who do benefit from these kinds of things and fewer who pay the bill. How do you get information enough so that people can make this cost-benefit judgment that you suggest? In which well, I, I would have to disagree that, in fact, everybody pays the bill. It's just that those who get the benefits know who they are and how much they're getting, and those who are paying don't know. And I think it's significant that those who are the biggest advocates of spending are also the biggest advocates of hiding the spending in the price of gasoline, or some would like to hide it in a value-added tax. Uh, I would love to see everything financed out of income tax and every taxpayer to get an itemized account saying, this is how much we spent last year for the Rural Electrification Administration and so on. But I, I don't think there's much chance of that going through in this Congress or, or in this century or next century. <laughs> that was Craig Thomas of Wyoming, Dr. Saul. Yes. Yes, Tom DeLay. Dr. Saul, so you, you take some interest here because uh, on the brain coming up, we had some discussion about the difference between a value-added tax and an income tax, and, and that is coming. I mean, the, 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 the d debate has already started as far as the Clinton administration is concerned. They're setting us up for some sort of consumption tax. Mm -hmm. And the debate is whether we tax consumption or we, or we tax income. What is your opinion on whether we sh should have a value-added tax or a, a sales tax versus an in income tax? Well, the two things can be made equivalent in terms of how they're, how they're structured uh, in terms of by income class. The real difference to me is the difference between a hidden tax and an open tax. And I'm all for open taxes. Because people really do need to know how much they're paying. How much are we paying in order that people in California can grow rice in the desert? You know? Yeah, we have a follow-up, Tom. Go ahead. So what, what you're saying is sort of like I've... I've People think I'm crazy because I'm against escrow accounts on mortgages because people nowadays don't pay property tax. They make house payments because they don't see their property taxes. It's all hidden in a yes. house payment. Uh, so uh, that's what we're talking about here is, is to have it. But even an, if you have a national sales tax, that's not a hidden tax, is it? No. I mean, if no. it's taxed on. So, so long as it's open. But I, but I think that the fact that people who want to spend more want to hide more. Uh, suggest that they know that people will not pay the real costs if they know the real costs. But there's no economic impact as far as you're concerned whether you have a consumption tax versus an income tax? Well, you would have to go about the, look at the specific tax you had in mind. If you had a consumption tax, you know, on bread, it would be different than a consumption tax on mink coats. Uh, but I'm saying you, you, you could adjust those things in such a way that they would be uh, equivalent across income classes, if that's what they're concerned about. But the real, the real concern, I think, is whether, is whether they're open or hidden. I've been asked to ask you, as you ask your questions, to go to the microphones on each of the sides to ask them and to introduce yourselves, although I'm going to introduce most of you just as a natural habit. But if you could repeat your name and grab a microphone, we'll be kind of orderly for all the TV folks and so on. Jim uh, Nussel? Nussel, Iowa. I was wondering, would you suggest to us to back and uh, correct the revisionist history that the Democrats are providing from the 80s. Or should we move on uh, to the future as, as also the well, I don't think you're going to move on to the future if the past is hanging over you. So long as a mythical past can be created, you're going to have to live with that. I've wondered where, where, where the Republicans have been over the past several years 
uh, as this great image has been projected and hammered home again and again and again in the media. And there's no way you're going to overcome that during an election campaign with a few uh, clever phrases here and there. You have to get people to understand that that's bunk. You have to call it bunk. And you can't say, well, I would somewhat differ some, my, from my good, good colleague and all that kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's fascinating to me to watch uh, these television uh, programs where there'll be some uh, young uh, Naderite uh, out there attacking some business, making all kinds of wild and wholly unsubstantiated charges, and the business executive is saying, well, no, you see, I, I re we, we really haven't done that. We've done things differently, and, he, and so on. And he gets absolutely nowhere. I mean, he has to turn to, to the guy and say, you're lying through your teeth, or else you're as ignorant as hell. <laughs> At that point scored, uh, Ralph, Ralph Regula. Uh, thank you. Ralph Regula, Ohio. It seems to me that this party has to stand for growth. That means good jobs. That's the problem with the, the AT&T and the IBMs. Those jobs aren't replaced uh, by any other uh, source. And uh, what would you suggest we adopt as policies to get the growth in our economy that's absolutely essential if we're going to meet uh, deficit reduction, if we're going to meet the desires of people for good jobs and good opportunities and a quality of life in the future. Again, I would look at history first. Uh, there was a time when the government did not take on this responsibility. And we did have growth. And we did have growing amounts of jobs. The reason Henry Ford was paying uh, these uh, huge salaries was not because some bureaucrat in Washington was jawboning him. He was paying it because that was the way to get the cars produced and out there in the market. So I think the notion that Washington has to have a hands-on is, is, is the fundamental fallacy. Uh, what, what's being said now, and particularly it's being uh, promoted as new, it's, it, everything is new if you don't know any history. Uh, <laughs> you know, the, the government labor business pa partnership, you know, that's mercantilism. Uh, that was centuries before Adam Smith. Adam Smith is new compared to that. But nevertheless, you've got to face the fact that tax policy, uh, environmental policy, OSHA, all those things have an impact on the ability of the economy to grow, so you simply can't ignore that fact. Oh, I, I wouldn't say ignore them. You have to fight against them, of course. Don't ignore them, because they're going to silently uh, eat away at any prosperity that starts to develop. So you're saying we need to be pointed toward revising some of these policies oh, no that question. inhibit growth. No, 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 no question about it. And you also need to be saying things like uh, every uh, emergency that is proclaimed is not an emergency in reality. Because all, the, this whole program is flying under the current state of mind of panic, which is allowing them to put these things through. I Jim, mean, we, Jim Lightfoot. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Jim Lightfoot from Iowa. The other evening after uh, watching the State of the Union address, uh, I left the House chamber with the feeling that I'd been to an old-fashioned tent revival with a charlatan preacher who was going to cure my athlete's foot and fix my car, but brother, all you have to do is leave your wallet and the signed blank check as you leave the tent. <laughs> uh, and I think as long as we can stall some of these plans and allow the snakes to crawl out of them, that's going to develop. But before I got failed the sanity test and got in this business, I was in the broadcasting business. And this is a criticism of myself and us as Republicans, and I'd like your viewpoint on it. I think, and if you agree or disagree, we get too intent on getting bogged down in all the details and in good government, quote unquote, and we forget to talk to the guy in the street in the language that he understands. And that's where the Democrats beat us every time, and that's what Bill Clinton did the other night because technically this program stinks. It just will not stand up to, to the broad light of day. But 80% of the people in America said it's great. Let's go for it. Is I agree that a legitimate criticism? That. I agree 100% with that. How do we change the rhetoric? I guess you change yourself first and then change the rhetoric. You have to decide that those, that those are the people you're going to address. You're not going to address the people in the beltway. You're going to talk to the people out there in the country as he talks to them. And if there's no confidence that the people are going to understand you, then, of course, you're not going to succeed. I think one of the things that makes, made Perot such a phenomenon last year, aside from money, which is never to be sneezed at, uh, uh, is that he could talk to the people directly. Uh, I had a sense that uh, the Republicans last year really didn't have anything to say directly to the people. They had a few slogans that came up, but it was all sort of ad hoc. 
and there has to be some kind of coherent vision that you present to the people. And when you do that, I think you can make it. Well, why, you don't have to think it. Uh, Ronald Reagan was elected uh, for two terms for a reason. Clay Shaw. Uh, Clay Shaw from Florida. One of the, uh, over, right over here. So way over the right. Yes. One of the, uh, one of the frustrating things that we have as Republicans is the concept that the Democrats have that more is better, whether it's in taxation or in spending. To give an example and to go back to something we were talking about, Tom DeLay was talking about, and you brought it up in uh, your remarks, is the value-added tax. From the standpoint of a global economy, we should be talking about a global, uh, a value-added tax as a substitute for corporate income tax. We are competing in the global market with companies from other countries that get their value-added tax back at the border when they export and our corporations exporting, they never get their corporate income tax back, so we go into the global market at a substantial disadvantage. The problem we're going to have, however, in trying to open up a dialogue on value-added tax, the Democrats are going to say, it's a great idea, but we're not going to get rid of the, uh, we're not going to get rid of the corporate income tax. So there we have actually damaged our competitiveness and damaged the business community. Same thing we're going to run into with welfare reform. On the Ways and Means Committee, the Republicans are working on a very, very good uh, welfare reform package, which is uh, almost identical to the one that, uh, that Clinton brought up this summer, some one or two years after we already had ours drafted. But the problem we're going to run into is the Democrats, and the only thing that we are hearing uh, in the Ways and Means Committee is that you're not spending enough. Yeah. So, I mean, the, when we try to be creative, we find out that we... Are, are then uh, involved more in uh, damage control rather than creativity. How would you suggest that, uh, that we as Republicans approach some of these subjects and be able to hold down the, uh, the spending habits and the collection habits of the, uh, the Democrats in Congress? Well, on the value-added tax, the problem as you describe it seems to be that the tax is not rebated, not that it's collected in one form rather than another. If you were to rebate, if you were somehow able to rebate the corporate income tax at the border, it would be the same thing. Now, as a practical matter, you probably couldn't do it as easily as you can with a value-added tax. But that's the problem, not the fact that it's a VAT versus uh, income tax. As far as proposing uh, alternatives, because the, one, one of the arguments of the pragmatists is we, we have to offer an alternative. In other words, uh, me too, we, we can do it better, only cheaper. And of course, uh, uh, when the other side has the votes, uh, your cheaper becomes more expensive. So that all that you're doing is just uh, um, uh, pitching to their strength. You're, you're throwing batting pack practice pitches up there to them. Um, I don't think there's, I don't, I, don't see, I don't see much promise in that strategy myself, frankly. Because if you're going to propose something and all they have to do is add on to it, then it doesn't matter how well crafted what you proposed was. They can make it twice as expensive uh, anyway. Uh, and if you, add on, if you have some new welfare scheme, that, that can simply be added on to the existing welfare schemes. Uh, if you're, if you're in a position to substitute one for the other, then that's, that, that's another question. But that's a problem that's going to take a couple of elections at least. Well, Dr. Sowell, time uh, passes very fast and you're having fun. I'm not going to take you off right now. I'm just going to pre-warn people we've got time for just the two questions that are already remaining, and then we've got to go on to the rest of the program. Doug B. Ryder and Matt Collins have the last two questions. Doug, you want to ask yours, and then we've got to move on out. Doug B. Ryder, Nebraska. Dr. Sowell, I'll change the subject a bit. You've written books on ethnic America and the politics and uh, e economics of race. Taught in Los Angeles, we saw Los Angeles <coughs> erupt. We can reconstruct it. But uh, what are your prescriptions, if you have any, for the basic elements of restoring harmony between the races in urban environments like that? Oh, wow. Again, I think the, the best thing the government can do is stop making matters worse. Uh, it doesn't help when the mayor, the governor, and the president of the United States start talking about how they understand the rage. That doesn't help at all. Uh, I remember some years ago uh, when there was riots threatened in Chicago, and Mayor Daley, the original Mayor Daley, uh, came, on the, came on the television and announced that he had given his police orders to shoot to kill. Uh, he was excoriated through the press throughout the country. And just last year, after the Los Angeles riots, I had my research assistant check out how many people had died as a result of that order. Nobody had died as a result of that order. But because we had a kinder and gentler policy last year, 
Five dozen people lost their lives. Now, intellectuals judge by words, and so they judge Mayor Daley harshly. Uh, I judge by deeds, and I judge the people harshly last year who were more concerned to be politically correct than they were with saving lives. Uh, I, I, would say that, I would say that one of the activities of government throughout the public school system is promoting so-called multicultural diversity. Now, if you want, now, there are wonderful theories behind this, none of which check out, by the way. Uh, but if you want to see multicultural diversity in action, look at Beirut, look at uh, uh, Ulster County in Ireland, look at uh, Sri Lanka, look at the Balkans. That's multicultural diversity in action. Uh, and, I, and if you look at the schools and colleges that are pushing this program with great zeal, that's where you'll find the greatest hostility among the various racial and ethnic groups on the campus. And if you look at campuses where the groups are getting along well, typically those are camp campuses that have not gone down that road. Matt Collins, for the last question. Collins is my name from George. <laughs> Speaking of the order of shoot to kill, <laughs> several years ago we were having a riot down in Augusta, Georgia, and then Governor Lester Maddox issued the order when he called in the National Guard to shoot to kill. Well, they killed about five folks, and the riot was over in a few minutes. That's not the question. Yesterday, we had a fellow down there who talked about the taxi cab driver and how well informed he was and knew President Ronald Reagan. He had simple terms for knowing him. One was he hated the communists or the Russians. If you had to define today three simple terms of what the Republican Party is noted for by the taxi cab driver, what are they? Do you agree with them? If not, what should they be? Wow. Uh, <laughs> now, now, I have a plane to catch at five. Nope, I didn't cut off the video. The broadcast got cut off, so we don't get a chance to hear Thomas Sowell's final response. Thank you again for all you do. Keep sharing these videos, like, subscribe. Also, leave comments below. They really help the engagement on the channel. It helps this channel be seen more widely. Also, all those links in the description are all things I personally use that I find beneficial. Hopefully you will too. There's all kinds of great rewards there for you. Check them out. Okay, until next time, thank you so much. Welcome to iTrust Capital. Setting up an iTrust Capital account is easy. From our homepage, itrustcapital.com, you'll enter your email and click Open Account. Fill in the information indicated and click Create New Account. You will receive an email that you'll need to open and click through to confirm your email address. This is where you will always log in to view and trade 24-7, 365. You'll find the Start Your Application button on the upper left side of the dashboard. Start filling in the data wizard with your personal information. Now choose the type of IRA you want to open and how you'll fund it. Enter your beneficiaries. This is who would inherit your IRA upon your passing. You must have at least one primary beneficiary. Your application is now submitted and your initial funding event has been created. If you're doing more than one funding event or want to add funds in the future, click Add Funds. Your application is now being processed. Keep an eye on your inbox for emails from our processing team with any questions while we review your application.